All right, we'll go ahead and begin. Thank you for joining us today for Beyond the Buzzword, Data Literacy. I'm excited about this webinar because I have to admit, I don't know a whole lot about data literacy, but I've learned a lot from Bridget and, uh, and done some research, so I'm excited to uh, to see what Bridget's gonna share and I'll, I'll join in as well. Uh, we're always very grateful for Technion hosting these webinars. Uh, both Bridget and I are consultants at Technion, which is great because we get to work with clients day in and day out helping with data. Uh, both of us are primarily focused on Tableau, uh, using Tableau Desktop, Tableau Server, Tableau Online, Tableau Prep, uh, all of those things to help our clients. Uh, but we work with people who are using Alteryx and building out data warehouses, uh, using Data Robot to do advanced predictive analytics. Uh, so it's it's a lot of fun to be able to uh, to do that and to serve our clients. Uh, there's Bridget's picture and my picture and our contact information. Definitely feel free to reach out to us anytime. We'd uh, we'd be excited to hear from you. Again, hosted by Technion, uh, so excited about that. Thank you, Technion, for hosting these webinars. All right, just a couple of notes before we actually get started. The webinar is being recorded and you should all receive a link in a day or two if you registered for this webinar, uh, which likely you did if you're here. So look for that and also for any previous webinars, they will also be uh, available to watch. We'll have some time hopefully for Q&A at the end, uh, but as we go, look for that uh, questions section on your GoToWebinar, and you can type those in at any point, and we'll uh, we'll look at those mostly at the end. But if you have any issues along the way, we'll uh, we'll see if we can address those. All right. Well, thank you, Joshua. I'm going to go ahead and take us back a little bit and look at what we're here today, and that is to begin defining data literacy. And there's a number of different de definitions for literacy, but the one I'm focused on today is having knowledge or competence. And so this is typically what we hear when we hear being computer literate, and this will also be how we're going to take data literacy today. And so often when we hear data literacy, one of the things we think about is the idea of chart making. And so what I've got here is a sample of different charts and so forth. And believe it or not, this is not data literacy. There's another term for that coined by Alberto Cairo, and that is the idea of graphicacy, so the ability to read graphics. The other part of this is oftentimes we're really focused on accuracy. Accuracy is an awesome thing. It's a great thing, and that's part of the process, but it isn't the entire part of it. And so without any further ado, let's look at what data literacy is. And so data literacy is an entire process and culture around data. It takes into account everything from the inputs to the storage to the modeling and prep of it to the point that we're going to hear about a lot today, which is defining, then into analyzing and output. So that is data literacy. It takes into account where the data comes from, what type of data, and then also helps us answer certain questions that are perhaps a little difficult, such as how should we use the data and how can't we use it, but also what's missing in it. And so by creating a culture of data literacy, we first start looking at things like inputs. And that can be something like Salesforce, that can be Eloqua, that can be Marketo. Um, there can be a number of different sources we work with on a daily basis. For example, my timesheet's in a certain program. I do a lot of data entry in other places. Um, but then I also work with government data. And so here's an example of what an input looks like in government data. And I love to call this one out. It's actually one of my favorite forms out there in part because we get to choose who's involved in decision making. So we can put a number in and depending on how you decide it, decisions. So for me, if you're in the room, maybe you're a decision maker. If we do a vote, then everybody is a decision maker. So to me, this is a very, very wide open definition. My other favorite piece of this form is I can pick three individuals 
I've got it date restricted. I can give you their name. I can give you some demographic details. I do want to call out one part of this, which is, you know, what is the person's age on this particular date? Um, way back in the Dirk Ages, when I was doing a lot of my work, you know, we had a couple classes where it's, you know, rather than getting a numerical age, get your birth date. That way you can always calculate and have an actual proper age. So if I were to take this form today, I'm a lot closer to being accurate because we're getting closer to December 31st, but I have high risk of some inaccuracy if I decide to tack on some extra years here. Without further ado, I'm also going to turn this over to Joshua. Okay, so Joshua, we can't hear you right now. All right, thanks, Bridget. Uh, yeah, so inputs. This is an aspect of data literacy that I find to be very important uh, and something that, quite honestly, I don't often think about as much as I should because I'm looking at the data as it's stored in a database or a data warehouse, and I'm thinking about how do I do analytics or visualization on that data. Uh, but thinking about how that data was actually input can be vitally important for understanding the context, understanding what data is available or not available, what assumptions I'm making that maybe I shouldn't be making. And so take something like this, a, a patient portal uh, where maybe a nurse or a hospital staff member is entering data about a patient. And so a lot of it seems very straightforward, uh, entering the patient's name. Uh, here we do have the date of birth, which is great, as Bridget pointed out, a very useful uh, aspect of the data because if I wanna know the patient's age uh, at any given point in time, knowing that date of birth is vital. Uh, but I'm gonna have to think about knowing their age and, and how that relates, and we'll, we'll think about that. Uh, gender, it's good to think about the fact that there are certain aspects of data entry and input where there may be a limited set of choices, uh, and the user may be forced to enter uh, a, a, a value that matches a limited set, or there may be uh, there may be a notes or details section where it's free text, and that's sort of the other end of the spectrum. So understanding those differences, understanding what's required for input versus what's not required for input, uh, what fields are optional or not. Uh, one thing I notice here on the uh, on the diagnoses section is that there doesn't necessarily seem to be a limit to the number of diagnoses that can be added, or maybe there is, and uh, and that would be important to understand. Uh, can they enter up to three or up to five, or is it unlimited? Understanding whether there can be a single primary diagnosis. All of these all of these things are limited by the the method of input, and uh, and controlled by that method of input. So understanding that is essential. Uh, to my literacy of the data and my communication of the data, uh, and also uh, for understanding the limitations of the data and not trying to communicate something with it that, that shouldn't be communicated. Oh, all patients only have three diagnoses. Well, that's because the screen only supports up to three. Uh, so that that's something I need to understand. Uh, we looked at the fact that I could uh, I could look at the date of birth and find out, you know, calculate at any point in time uh, what the patient's age is. But that could be a relative uh, thing because I've got other dates. I've got when they arrived and when they were admitted and when they were discharged. Does it matter how old they are today or should I be thinking of the patient as in terms of how old they were uh, in relation to some of these other events? And so, so that's something I'll need to think about. Again, another another potentially limited set of values here, but another uh, open set of values with the discharge instructions. And so understanding the input of data, the limitations that that brings, the opportunities that that brings for capturing some data, and, uh, and some of the assumptions that we might make 
based on that input is vitally important. Next in the cycle is storage. So not necessarily do I store it on a solid state disk or a, or a traditional uh, hard disk or uh, that sort of thing. Uh, no, this is more how do I capture that input and store it and what format am I storing it in? So this could be this could be a JSON format. This could be a SQL Server format. This could be all kinds of different possibilities. So for example, if I took that input and thought about how is that being stored in a database, it might look something like this. It might be broken up into multiple different tables. I might have a table of patients that's capturing just some of those demographic details, name, date uh, of birth, gender, race, those sorts of things, uh, and, and things which don't necessarily change or, ver or change very often. Uh, so I'm capturing that in a table. I might have a table that captures the visits. So every time the patient visits uh, the hospital, I'm capturing uh, different events and dates, uh, and, and then I'm capturing things like what was the discharge disposition. But here, that may be stored as, as a numeric value instead. And so, so there may be pieces of data that are available, and there may be other places that I have to look to find the definition for those, for those uh, details. Also, it's uh, important for me to understand as I'm storing the data, what does it mean if, if I'm not storing a value? So here, for example, I've got a patient visit that doesn't have a discharge date or a discharge disposition. What does that mean? Uh, does it mean that they have been admitted, but they're still in the hospital as of this point in time? That's, that's a possible assumption that I might make, but it's important for me to understand that and understand why certain things are stored in certain ways. Uh, here's the discharge disposition. So I had the ID and now I've got the, the linking that maybe gives me more understanding of when they left the hospital, where did they go and, and why did they go there? Uh, so, so that may be stored separately. Uh, if they had different, uh, different diagnoses that may be stored in a, in a lookup table as well. Uh, here's an ICD-10 table. So there, there may be certain data that, uh, that is stored in certain ways because it's required to be stored that way by, uh, by law uh, or, by, uh, or, or, or by policy that, uh, that certain codes must be stored uh, and certain descriptions must be stored and, and, and never changed. So that's important to understand. Uh, here's, here's a table that maybe links together the visit and the diagnoses uh, with a patient or with a, with a patient visit. So, so understanding that there could be more than one diagnosis per visit uh, helps me understand why, why the data is stored that way. And this is only one possible way of storing the data. I mean, it could have been stored in a JSON file. It could have been uh, stored in, in some other kind of format. It could have been dumped into one large file. Uh, and, and each one of those is going, each one of those possibilities is going to bring with it uh, different assumptions and different uh, different limitations potentially of what I can do with the data and how I can read it and how much uh, I can I can bring together. So I need to understand that, and I also need to understand: is there a strong link between the data? There is here. So if if I have a patient visit, I expect that I have that patient in the patient table. Uh, but there may be cases where I have data that doesn't necessarily have a strong link. Uh, I have, I have a, a record of a, of a sale, and I also have a record of a marketing campaign. Can I link those two together and correlate the fact that that marketing campaign may have influenced the sale? Or maybe it didn't. Uh, so there may be data that's stored separately that needs to be brought together, but I'll have to think through how do I do that? And that's kind of the uh, the next step then of of thinking through uh, from storage uh, modeling and prep of the data. So so it's great that I've got the input. It's great that I've stored it, and I've I need to understand all of that, and then I need to think through what do I want to do with it, and what can I legitimately do with it. So if I'm modeling and prepping it, I need to think that through. It could be something like this. It could be taking 
uh, each one of those tables and just linking them together or building out a whole, an entirely new model. So lots of times I'm working with a data warehouse, a star schema of, of sorts. So that may be one potential way to model the data. One thing that I really love is, uh, is Tableau Prep. And that gives me a lot of flexibility in modeling that data. So, so I, can, I can prep it and model it in all kinds of different ways. I might start with the patient visit and, uh, and start to think through what, you know, what fields do I need or not need in the data, uh, which, which pieces of the data are relevant uh, to the model that I want to construct, and, uh, and which pieces need to be cleaned up. What happens if I have null values? What do I do with those? Do I need to keep those? Uh, are those important to understanding the data or are they junk? And do I need to throw them out? And then how, how do I relate some of these data? So, so if I'm doing things like joins, I may, be, I may be losing some of the data and I need to understand, uh, is that okay? And I need to be transparent through this entire process of how I'm changing the data, even as I'm modeling it. And so, so that's an important aspect to data literacy is understanding what am I doing along the process that is potentially changing the data and not just shaping it or storing it differently, but actually, uh, actually in this case, losing records of data. Maybe they're not important, but I need to be transparent about the fact that I'm not even keeping a couple of the patients here uh, in the data as I'm building out my new model. And, uh, and then there are multiple layers of this. So for example, uh, my goal might be to build out a model uh, and then store it in a different way. So for example, here, Here's one possibility of taking all of those patients and storing them uh, with one record per patient per event. So, so the patient arrives and then the next ref, uh, record talks about their admission and the next uh, record talks about the administration of medicine and the start or end of a surgery. Uh, and so each record describes that event and it becomes a very long data set. And there are certain kinds of ways that I can use this uh, data, but I've, I've chosen to model it and shape it and store it in this way. Uh, here's, here's a patient who arrived, was admitted, evaluated, discharged, and then they arrived again. So, so I'm, gonna be capturing, uh, I'm gonna be capturing events across multiple visits in this way. But that's only one possibility, and there, there are reasons why I might choose this. Uh, here's another possible way of storing the data. Here I've, I've taken each patient and I've aggregated the data uh, at a patient level. So I've captured some of the demographics, uh, age, race, gender, uh, weight, uh, some, of the, some of the metrics that I wanna capture. And then I'm, I'm aggregating up how many visits did they have? Uh, did they have uh, COPD or congestive heart failure, and I'm choosing which of these I think are important, or maybe maybe I'm listing them all out because ultimately the goal of this data set is to go to Data Robot, where it wants to understand uh, it wants to understand the the uh, the predictions that I make are going to be at a row level, and everything else are going to be attributes for that row so that it can evaluate and build out a predictive model. And uh, and so I'm looking at things like how many diagnoses did they have or their admission source. And so the prep is leading me to a new model, which is ultimately leading me to a couple of new inputs and, and data sets. So this becomes an input to data robot. And based on that, then I may end up with a few other uh, data sets that are stored in different ways. So for example, data robot then gives me data like this, uh, tells me all of the different features that I, that I fed into it and tells me the importance. So the number of inpatient visits becomes a very important feature uh, for predicting whether a patient's going to be readmitted 
uh, the discharge disposition becomes another important feature. And so I might take that data set and start to try to understand it and think through how do I model it and store it and and prep it to to do that. Uh, and then ultimately I may may take that data and start to communicate it in other ways so that I can say, you know, who's who's likely to be a readmitted of of the patients we now have in the hospital. And so then I'm I'm communicating that. And I'm uh, and I'm not just treating as a as a black box. I'm actually trying to communicate why uh, this prediction has been made, and so that becomes an important aspect of data literacy. Uh, not just treating things as a black box, but having full transparency throughout the entire process to help people understand why certain decisions were made about the data, why certain data was usable, what that data uh, indicates what's important about the data, and all of that becomes important in this cycle. Next, we would uh, we would look at defining uh, the data and and adding some definition around it. And for that, I'll turn it back over to Bridget. Thank you, Joshua. So going back into defining, and this to me is one of the most pivotal parts of this process, is really understanding the data and communicating what that data is. We saw all the different decisions that Joshua made, and so it's really critical that somebody like me as the analyst understands what he's doing, what he's done, what changes have happened, and what I can truly infer from this data. And so you'll notice that defining kind of touches on all of this. And so how do we define? One of the ways that we define is by making very accessible, very clear folders. And so these folders may not reflect what the table structure is, but may reflect a business user understanding. I may put it in folders that match my inputs. I may say, okay, I've got this holiday calculation and I want all of these things together because otherwise it's going to get very, very confusing. I've got location hierarchies that belong on their own. I may put anything to do with an order, and I may even put all my dates in one folder. So I'm trying to be as transparent as possible, but I'm also going into each of my fields and commenting and explaining what these things do and where they were derived from. I'm going in and I'm making sure that my calculations, whenever I do a calculation, is really clear about why I'm doing it, what I'm doing, and the transformations I'm making. So that way when somebody else comes in, they know what I'm doing. So that defining piece to me is probably the most critical and often overlooked part of this. It's where perhaps we don't necessarily spend as much time as we need to, but we're going to find out in, later in this webinar why this is so important. Moving on to the fun piece that we all know and recognize, we saw a little bit of this with Joshua where he started digging into the analysis, he started putting things together, and he started understanding his data. You'll notice from that he had he exercised his graphicacy, so he was very skilled in picking charts and making sure that he was picking the right ones. He was thinking about how his audience would receive it, and he was also making sure that it was meaningful to him. He kept in mind too the data. So for example, here you can see we were working with a blended data set. So we were really cognizant about how did we blend that data appropriately? What fields did we match up versus what fields did we not match up? And then how do we make sure that this is accessible? So this is actually a collaborative effort. So you can see I took this chart, and you'll see the output in a little bit, where I was able to then make this analysis. We're very similar in some ways to Joshua, where we've got some items preserved, but we've also got some goals from the hospital. We want to reduce our readmissions. Um, anybody in the healthcare industry will tell you readmissions are not good things. And so we're going to take our time, really look at this. We're going to look at those factors to readmission and compare it in relative importance to the model versus how likely this is this to happen. We're going to get a view of our patients and really go through and troubleshoot and start figuring out where our patients are and how we can help them not come back um, unless they absolutely need to. So that's kind of a whole scale view of data literacy. It really takes into account the entire cycle. It, it looks at the inputs. We looked at where we were limited. Maybe we only do get three diagnosis codes. Maybe when we store it, we make certain types of decisions and even aggregate it. When we model it, we make decisions. And then you can see with that defining piece, I'm making it easier for other people to access it and analyze it so that when we get an output, it's true to the form. 
it's accurate in a way that we expect. So that to me is really what data literacy is. It's, it's this all encompassing cycle. Now the other part of this is looking at how do we put people within this model? Who gets to have what skills? When we are building a center of excellence, very often um, I personally see these advertisements for full stack, you know, and they want somebody who can manage the storage, the modeling, the defining, the analyzing and the output. Um, my typical response to this is that you're asking for a unicorn. It's very hard, it's quite burdensome to put on an individual, and typically what happens is that person runs out of bandwidth. And so that's a part of where we really try to encourage having teams and building groups of people rather than investing on a sole team of one. And so how do you build a data literate team that helps support data literacy throughout an organization? And to me, it really starts with the data Lorax. It starts with somebody who will speak for the data for the data has no tongues. And so the different expectation here is looking for somebody who is an analyst and an ambassador. Sometimes we title these people designers or people working in visualization. We sometimes call them developers. If we've got some flair, we may even call them an artist. And typically what that person handles, the parts that we recognize are things like defining, analyzing, and output. But they're also going to take a look at those inputs. They're gonna really have an understanding of where the data is coming from so that they can have a very clear understanding of those definitions. But this person isn't going to work alone. This person's going to partner with a data steward. Again, this is somebody who has titles maybe like data architect, data engineer. They may even get lumped into IT. Um, but this person also handles inputs. They're handling the storage, they're handling the modeling and prep, and they're also handling the defining. So you see that we've intentionally put overlap on inputs and defining, the two areas where we tend to put the least amount of concentration. So this is great. This gives us a, a nice standard center of excellence. The next question is, where do we put our user base? And so I'm glad that Joshua mentioned some of our other webinars because this does reference some material from another webinar where we talked about how do you implement Tableau. So I'm not going to dive too deeply into this scatter plot, but what I will say is that there are different paradigms for running a COE. Sometimes you don't want a bunch of people accessing the data. Sometimes the, the actual analysis is software. So we tend to limit that. So you've got kind of this two different paradigms of who has control of the data. So you've got your choice of data guardian or none shall pass, if you will, and versus a data steward where I will happily work with you to get you the data that you need in a way that's appropriate. So either model has governance. The other part of this is who gets to analyze data. And so there are different paradigms here. Uh, traditional BI tends to err on, you know, very few people have access to shape the data or access the data, and let alone few people can analyze the data, versus where Tableau tries to push us, which is a data democracy. So we'll kind of see th these two comparisons are really the ones I wanna focus on today. We've got more information on the other ones on different webinars. So with that in mind, Let's take a look at where traditional BI falls. And so we understand that this is tightly guarded. Um, typically what happens when we do a traditional implementation is that our users are typically working with the inputs. They're either accountable to them, they're working in them, they are doing something about the inputs, whether it's a salesperson entering Salesforce and putting in their sales, whether it's a nurse entering Epic and putting in patient information. But typically our people accessing reports have some level of access to or responsibility to the inputs that we use. They will sometimes have some responsibility in defining what the items are that we're using. So they may say, oh, this metric's really important to us, or oh, hey, we need to monitor this. And then somebody goes off, does the analysis, and then they have a kind of critiquing session over the output. And so it's a very, very small footprint. And what you typically find is that the perceived data graphicacy of these organizations is very small. Typically in a traditional BI, you hear, oh, I need a table. And that's partly so that the users can export the data and do their own analysis somewhere else. So that's kind of what happens within a traditional BI paradigm. Let's compare that to what a data democracy requires. You'll notice that the footprint has significantly grown. Uh, for example, we've kept the same amount of focus on inputs, I've increased the depth on defining, and then I've even allowed my, my users an access into the analytical loop so they can go in, they can web edit, they can make charts right on server. 
they can potentially save their output either for themselves or to share with others. Now, what this requires is that my ambassador is supporting them and training them. I'm still keeping a lot of these users out of the data steward loop. I'm still having them work with my ambassador who may say, okay, great, here's the data source for this, or okay, great, I hear you, we will go ahead and make a data source for that. So there is still a closed loop on the data side. But that's typically how you see data literate organizations grow. And then what happens is the more you increase your corporate literacy, the more you're able to make innovative analyses. And so without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and roll it to Q&A. All right, so there are no questions so far, but if you have any questions you'd like to ask about anything we've covered today or anything related to what we've covered today, feel free to enter those. So Bridget, one thing while uh, uh, while people are entering their question, one thing that really struck me as I thought through uh, data literacy and and just thinking through the big picture is that is that like you said, there's no way that that one person, either either I or anyone else, could could potentially cover every aspect of that. But how how should we or how could we think through maintaining a big picture with our organization's data? Uh, is there is there a way to do that without uh, without missing uh, something or becoming overwhelmed? So one of the things I see as centers of excellence start maturing is sometimes they'll have somebody almost cross this path right here. They'll say, okay, I'm going to put somebody who handles modeling and prep. And so you kind of start crisscrossing people in certain spots. So that's one way. You make sure that you've got the pairing. But in two, I think it's really critical to see those inputs. And I think that makes all the difference in the world. When you see what data exists in the spaces that it exists, in the form that it exists, I think that makes a massive difference. Um, probably one of the best examples, and I, I talk about this a lot when I talk about data literacy, is everybody gets those cute little cards when they go to the store, and very few people know what those cards do. They, they get the card, they get their little discount, and they go home. And it's like, okay, but now I have a unique identifier for you. And half the time that you, unique identifier is tethered to your telephone. So now I have access not only to your unique purchases, but if you've given me your telephone number, I can likely tell who you are, again, provided you're using your phone number and not some other phone number. And then if I'm going out and getting other data, I can start getting a lot more data on you because I have a primary key that is uniquely identifying for you. And so that to me is really the crux of data literacy. It's that you, it's historically invisible until you really think about all the inputs we have, all the data we have, how we then pull it in, how we then shape it, and how we define it because those measures are not always agreed, agreed upon. And then lastly, how do we analyze it and output it? Yeah, yeah, I totally, totally agree. One thing that struck me with the inputs especially is I tend to think of it from a very technical standpoint. So, you know, even even showing it, I show a screenshot and say, here's, you know, here's, here's where someone can input the data. But I, I think it's also important to think through the people side of that. And just because there's a field that can be entered uh, I need to think through what kinds of biases or uh, or reasons for entering the data in a in a in a bad or wrong way might someone have. I mean, we've all been to the store where we see on the on the checkout screen that the uh, the person is supposed to ask for uh, my email address, but they just type a bunch of garbage, you know, or or a a nurse doesn't have time to enter the uh, 
a, a full description so so it becomes it becomes something that's skipped or or uh, or or missed or maybe there's a maybe there's an incentive that uh, that I might want to enter a time incorrectly uh, to to make it look like I'm more efficient than I am and uh, and so all of those things it strikes me that that we need to understand those along with the technical aspects of of inputs yeah I definitely agree and that kind of flows into I'm actually going to jump and go to this question on what are the ways we can educate our users on the importance of data literacy if it's not something they are familiar with how to get how to get across the value of all why this is important to me I, I really like showcasing that store example um, there is a level where data literacy delves heavily with data ethics and so to me if you don't know what's collected if you don't know how it's being used that's a conundrum and so I mean, that, that part is one of the reasons why I'm personally very passionate about data literacy. Um, in the 90s, it was computer literacy. It's how do you navigate the world when so much of it's driven by computers and technology? And we've seen how that change has occurred from the 90s onward. And so the world right now is very saturated and driven by data. And some of the data we have control of, some of the data we don't. And so to me, I really think putting it in human-centric terms, the, this is how your world is shaped by data. This is how data directly affects you. Personally, I'm on the paranoid side. That store example works really, really well with me. Joshua, do you have anything to add? No, not right off, but I do see we have a couple of questions. Uh, David asks, how can you make defining visible to Tableau uh, the um, to Tableau viewers uh, who can't see the definitions of dimensions and measures? So, so how? What are some ways that you can have that kind of transparency uh, when the user is only a viewer? Tooltips. Tooltips are probably one of my favorite ways of explaining what is this measure or what is this thing. Um, some of the other organizations where particularly academic organizations or really strongly scientific organizations will actually make a separate metadata source of all the measures and what they mean. And then you can tuck that into a hidden fold out container. And so that way you've got this question mark of what do these things mean? And you can actually click on it and get your data dictionary right there. So, I mean, I've seen both of those as options joshua yeah I'd, I'd have to say that that's probably the method i would use most is is tool tips or or maybe a question mark that reveals a, a container i do think that that is unfortunately one thing that gets missed a lot is the fact that we may have had all kinds of team meetings and meetings with the data governance team and, and thinking through the def definitions, but communicating that to the end users is equally as important and, and maybe even more important because they're making decisions. Uh, but if they don't understand what something means, uh, that decision may not be well informed. So the next uh, question. I've got is our system has started to roll out the ability to create data analytics in similar formats. Seems like they point us to the standardized color palette, but it would be so much simpler if the approved palettes were locked down. Could our management do that? Um, I don't know of a way necessarily to do that directly. I know of some cheater ways within the data source where you can set certain colors to default, but that's typically on dimensions, not measures. Joshua? Yeah, I'm not aware of any way to lock it down. I mean, you can definitely build those those palettes into uh, Tableau, and there's uh, there's a preferences file, and you can even, I believe, publish that to Tableau Server. But I don't know that you can force that to be the only selection. Uh, Tableau is such an open tool for allowing visualization. I don't don't think there's any way that you could force it. 
One of the things I've also seen other organizations do is they've kind of created a grading. So you you set up the templates, you you help people find, here's our style guide, here's all of this. And then what they do is they actually grade every dashboard as this one is approved, this one is not. And so I have seen that as a methodology. And so depending on your organization, that may also be a solution. I believe NetJets presented it this year at the Tableau conference. And so that might be a really good video to watch is the NetJets, um, how they do the, kind of their dashboard approval process. All right, perfect. Karen asks, uh, what are ways that we can educate our users on the importance of data literacy if it's not something they're familiar with? How do you get across the value of why all of this is important? So that was kind of one we answered a bit earlier, um, but really for me, it's finding the items that resonate with that person. So again, I'm very paranoid when it comes to shopping and stores and being monitored. That's what works with me. So find out what really works with them as far as you understand data encompasses all of this, and this is why it's so essential to understand the entire loop of here's where you see it, here's all the things that happen in the background, and here's what you access. Yeah, that makes sense. That, and I, I agree. I think, I think it's, it, it is a matter of building that data culture and understanding that the way that everyone interacts with the data may be different from user to user. Uh, the way that that someone inputs the data uh, is different from the way that the data, uh, you know, the data steward is is storing and prepping the data. Uh, but, and, and that's different than the way that the end users are consuming uh, the analysts' uh, work uh, along the way. But, but I think that at every at every level, uh, building that culture of valuing the data, understanding the data, and and additionally uh, having transparency uh, to understand the entire process, so that so that everyone trusts the data and trusts the analysis that's done on the data. I think that that is vitally important for for getting a, a real passion about this within your organization. All right, I don't see any other questions. So Bridget, any final thoughts? I think that's a wrap. You articulated it extraordinarily well. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. It's always a pleasure to have you. We're excited about next year and all that that will bring. So definitely uh, stay tuned, and we're, uh, we're looking forward to an exciting 2020. Thank you so much, and we'll see.